This podcast is made possible through donations from listeners like you and our partners at Tallman Equipment. Tallman Equipment prides itself in having more linemen tools in stock than anyone else. And now, when you're shopping online at tallmanequipment.com, look for the truck logo that says Fast Ship on hundreds of items on their website. That logo means that item is in stock and ready to ship the same day in most cases. When it comes to getting the tools and equipment linemen need, trust Tallman. Line 11 Clothing Company, making apparel for our first responders with a positive message to patriots that you can be proud of. The proceeds of the cost goes to helping our foundation ignite the fire for father engagement. Give them a follow at Line 11 Clothing on Instagram. And finally, Monzingo Knives. Each knife is created with craftsmanship that only a tradesman could provide. Find them on Instagram at Monzingo Knives and get your American made Monzingo knife today. Welcome to the Show Up Dad podcast. This podcast has been created for hardworking fathers. At the Show Up Dad, we recognize that fathers providing for their children is certainly important. But when men truly understand their unique role and gain the knowledge and skills to be great fathers, they can transform and impact future generations. Today's guest is Pablo Huerta. He is an apprentice lineman and a father of two beautiful girls. He has been in the trade for around three years. He grew up in Monrovia, California, where he spent most of his childhood in the juvenile system. What inspired me to invite him on this show was a podcast that I heard him where he started talking about all the adversity he had to go through and overcome. The reason we go through hardships is because of the choices a lot of times, but we can't let that define us. What I mean by this is we cannot allow our circumstances to create in us a victim mentality. And that is what drew me to Pablo. I saw a man who made mistakes and wanted to be better for himself and for his daughters. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Pablo to our show up. Thank you, Pablo. Hey, thank you, David. Thank you for having me, man. It's a pleasure and an honor, man. Absolutely, homie. Um, Pablo, like I start off with all my guests, I want you to kind of let us know about your childhood and what you remember it and just give us a, a background of your story, if you don't mind. Um, so both my parents are from, uh, from Chile, South America. Um, my dad came out to this country, I think around the sixties. Um, and and little by little, I guess he brought over my mom. Uh, and I had a couple of siblings out here. I was born out here. I'm 37 years old. Mm -hmm. And after a few months, uh, that I was brought into this world, um, mom wanted to go back to, uh, to Chile. Mm -hmm. So went to Chile and I was out there until I was like maybe five. Um, I remember vividly uh, a lot of stuff from Chile. Um, mm -hmm. So I got a pretty good memory when it comes to that stuff. Um, and my dad basically raised us all um, on his own out here. He brought us all back. My mom never came back and uh, I never get, did get a chance to see my mom again. She passed away like three years ago. Um, so my dad raised us, um, uh, all I knew was Monrovia, California. That's where I grew up at, um, basically almost born and raised. Um, uh, I didn't, my childhood, uh, I don't, my dad wasn't a gang member. My dad wasn't a drug addict, alcoholic. I could probably count in my hand, in one hand, how many times I seen my dad with like a, a drink in his hand. Mm -hmm. My dad's 82. He turned 82 last last week, man. And I was blessed to be able to spend it with him. Wow. Uh, and he was a, uh, you know, he's from a different era. It's yeah. Like, hey, beyond what, what what we've gone through or how we are. And so he did hit things his way. And um, I just like kind of drifted off, man, and started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Um, at a real young age. And then I started going to uh, juvenile hall at 11. I was in and out uh, until I was 14. Mm -hmm. And at 14, uh, I ended up getting sent to the California Youth Authority. Um, people that don't know what that is, it's basically like a prison mm -hmm. for youth offenders. Um, but it was basically a gladiator school. It was like, there was really no, I mean, I can't say there wasn't any re rehabilitation there because there was, but 
um, you had to have made that choice. And then when you get thrown in in a place with a bunch of young kids, I mean, teenagers that really don't care, mm-hmm. um, it's it's like you're going to either become that or be a part of it or you're going to have a lot of trouble, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so when I went to the youth authority, uh, I was sentenced to do uh, 18 months if I behaved. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't behave. And I ended up getting out when I was 28. So I spent, well, at that time, half my life in, um, in the youth authority and in prison because I ended up going to a, a prison. And while I was in prison, I, I was still acting a fool. Um, there were so many things I went through. I mean, we could go on and on about that yeah. and we just wouldn't have time, but like, I went through a lot of things in prison. Uh, a lot of the things, uh, that happened in there and the stuff that I got involved in were, were all choices, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, uh victims and I think I mentioned to you when we were talking, like, I- I'm not a victim here. Um, mm-hmm no one forced me to do anything, you know, like people that find out about my story, they're like, oh man, that's messed up, man. Like they did you wrong. They didn't do me wrong. If I would have, if I would have been a good boy, I would have been home in 18 months. Right. You know, so, um, but the thing is, is that, you know, when I first went to a board review in, in YA, the first year that I went to board, um, just in that year, that first year, I caught like five years in time at because I was fighting. I was, you know, a lot of stuff happened in that first year. And so I was 15 at the time, David. And when they told me, oh, we're, we're giving you another five years. Um, I was like, damn, that's that's a long time for me. Yeah. Like, I was like I'm going to be 20 years old. I'm only 15. That sounded like forever, man. And in actuality, like five years is really nothing, man. Five years just flies by like that. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it made me not care anymore. So instead of scaring me, it just made me worse. Wow. And, and then, you know, I ended up catching more time. I caught three more court cases while I was in there, Mm -hmm. which is why I ended up doing all that time. And, uh, I came home in 2012, I paroled from, uh, from Pelican Bay from Crescent city. And, um, throughout that time towards like, I, I would say maybe the last three or four years of my term, uh, my mentality started changing, bro. Um, mm-hmm. I just wasn't feeling the, what I believed in at one point, you know, cause I was all for it. And I started seeing a lot of things that I didn't like, a lot of things I I didn't agree with. And the main thing for me, and I thank God that I never got deep into drugs or alcohol, man. And I think that's a big factor in my life because, um, I mean, yeah, I dabbled in some drugs like as a kid, but um, I've been clean since I was 14. Yeah, I'm, I'm 37 today, and I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, heck yeah. And I see a lot of people that were in my situation um, and still are in some somehow, some way, still in it. And it's because of drugs, bro. Yeah. And I feel that drug play, drugs play a big role in a lot of people that are in there and that are out here. And mm-hmm. I think that was like the big, one of the main things, if not the main thing that saved me you know, mm-hmm. because I had a clear mind and I wasn't, I was dealing with so much stuff, David. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was going through. I ended up learning so much about myself out here. Yeah. You know, I, I realized that, Hey, sometimes I, I do get sad. I do get depressed. Uh, I, I do have feelings. I hurt. I, I feel things, you know, and at, and at certain times in there, I didn't know what I was going through, man. Yeah. So I, th- I think yeah. a lot of times, Bob, you know, I, I think a lot of times, brother, we don't like, we don't want to show our emotions, right? We, we talked about it on the podcast so many different times, how we were taught 
don't show your emotions. And especially in a place like Pelican Bay or the youth authority that you went through and all that stuff, you don't want to show any kind of weakness. I mean, even let's take it a step further, even in the line trade, you don't really want to show any kind of weakness. You don't want to show that they're getting to you because then it's like sharks in the water. It's that blood in the water, you know, and then people start picking and picking. I don't know why it's human nature for people to do that pack mentality, whatever it may be, but it just seems that it's human tendency to point out people's weakness. Now, one of the things I learned, cause I used to do that with my wife. Okay. If I saw something that bugged me, if I saw weakness, I'd pick and pick and pick. If I saw that she was angry, I would pick and pick and pick. Right. And what it was is that our brains, it's not necessarily that we're drawn to any kind of negativity because we're not inher- inherently negative as people. What it is, is we recognize that is not correct behavior. So we're drawn to that. Our, our psyche, our, our senses are drawn to that behavior that is not okay. We're drawn to it because it's almost like a warning mechanism to let us know, say, hey, man, that's not good behavior. So yeah. we're drawn to that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I think that's what happens to us a lot of times when we're drawn to a certain lifestyle, we're drawn to drama, right? Yeah. You know, because I mean, seriously, how many people do you see today that they're not interested unless something bad is happening in your life? Yep. Yeah. And, and it's sad. Yeah, it is sad, man. Now, with that being said, brother, um, one of the things that, I heard you saying is that your father wasn't the typical father like you saw probably in, in, in the incarceration that you went through, right? Your dad was a pretty hardcore dude, uh, probably disconnected. I'm not, you know, I don't know for sure, but you know, if that time frame, that era, those guys were hard, dude, and yeah. they did the best they could. You know, my dad's from that era as well. And that dude was just a hard dude, man. And it was like, no emotions, no nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, And that leaves us kind of empty too as as kids because you need to hear, hey, man, I'm proud of you. Hey, son, you know what I mean? I love you. You know, I never really heard that from my dad either, you know, so it always left me open to wanting to seek validation, right? So with that being said, how did you see a lot of those guys that you're in jail that didn't have that relationship like you did with your father, like didn't have a dad who actually cared and, and stuff like that. Were they from broken homes or what did you see? What did you notice? If- Most definitely like broken homes. And mm-hmm. I can't even think right now off the top of my head from my criminal career, right? From yeah. juvenile to all the places I've been to up to an adult. I can't even think of one person right now that I could say that their dad was there. Wow. Um, it, it was either mom or nobody. Mm-hmm. My dad, you know, that's why I say, like, I, I, I don't hold anything against my dad. Like, he did what he knew, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, and there wasn't really no, hey, I'm proud of you, mijo, or I love you, you know? There wasn't really much of that. But as I got older you know, we started communicating more and I wanted to break that barrier with him. And I was in there, you know, Mm -hmm. because at that time, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to tell my dad what I was getting myself involved in. Mm -hmm. I didn't, and I didn't have no kids at the time, obviously. Yeah. I didn't want to give him the harsh reality of what I had became and what I was believing in and what I was willing to do. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to communicate with my dad in case something happened, in case yeah. I didn't see him again, in case I never came home. And so I started telling my dad, like, hey, dad, I love you. Like, I thank you. I thank you for being a great dad. I I thank you. My dad, the first time I went to juvenile hall, at <laughs> he told me, you ever go back, I won't never come see you. I won't be there for you. Hey, David, every single time I went Mm -hmm. back to the hall, the first weekend, my dad was there with a bag of hygiene, like cosmetics, the soap and stuff that he could bring in. So I could have, he just had that and he'd have no words for me. 
he would sit there mad as hell, <laughs> <laughs> hoping he could whoop me. Yep. And but he was there every every time, and I I thank him for that. I apologize to him for you know being the way I was, you know, mm-hmm. and um, that actually made our relationship a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of things that I do today as a father, as as a coworker, as a human being that I've learned from my dad. Like my dad was the type of person is like, he's just going to show you through action. Yeah. He's not gonna say through too many words. And I've, and I picked up on a lot of his, um, his lessons he was trying to teach to us, my brothers, my sisters, um, through his actions, you know? And, um, mm-hmm. uh, so I learned a lot from my man, man, my dad, he, he, he taught me a lot, man. Um, and he's still, he's still in his way, even at 82 years old. But mm-hmm. um, I appreciate him a lot, man. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, for sure, man. That's that's interesting that you said that he was there no matter what. <laughs> you know, um, I what I wanted to ask you, Pablo, is did he ever like now that you guys have your relationship, right? Yeah. Did he ever like wonder or ask? And be like, man, what did I do for you to do the things you did, son? Or did he, does he take it as personal responsibility for what you've done? I mean, I, I know, like, just looking back and putting myself and showing empathy and putting myself in your dad's shoes. And even just being a, a, a cabron like I was with my dad. You know, I'm always wondering if my dad takes it upon himself and be like, where did I go wrong? Like, what did I do? What could I have changed so my son wouldn't have to go through this? Yeah. He it, it actually to answer both your questions, mm-hmm. he <clears throat> a lot of blame on himself, man. And mm-hmm. we did talk about that because uh you know I I uh just to mention real quick, like when my dad came to see me one time, this was probably 2001, and it was in the youth authority, and I already knew that I wasn't coming home anytime soon. My dad didn't know that, and mm-hmm. my dad was moving out of state. And I had decided already that I was going to cut off my whole family. Like I was, I wasn't going to call my dad no more. I wasn't going to write. And it was because it was hard to see my dad come see me um, at the time in the place where I was at being in a cage. It was like a dog. It was like a dog kennel cage kind of, you yeah. know, it's like think of a phone booth, but it's a cage and that's where they're put us at. And now being a father, I can't even imagine having to go in there and see my kid being shackled up and thrown in a damn cage like that, you know? And my dad was there every single weekend. He mm-hmm. was there. And so I had decided I, I wasn't going to communicate no more because I didn't, I didn't want to keep seeing that hurt, that pain in my dad. And I would see it then, man. Um, but obviously he wouldn't communicate it. And I stopped. I didn't see my dad. I didn't, I cut off all, ties with the outside world for almost 10 years bro Mm -hmm. and to this day i don't even know how my dad got a visiting for him but he came to see me in prison it was almost 10 years man and that was one of the times i see my dad cry it wasn't too many times i see my dad cry but when he seen me he he just overcame with emotion yeah and just like man what the hell are you doing here (laughs) like how'd you get in here (laughs) i'm so happy to see him I wasn't overcome as how he was till I got back in my cell and then it hit me in my cell. Like, damn, my dad just came, man. And I, 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 I was overcome with, with emotion. Yeah. I, I told my dad right then and there, I said, look, dad, um, it is not your fault. And he had placed blame on himself for years, man, because there was an incident where I had a ward from a, a group home, a placement. Mm-hmm. And, and I ended up getting home. I had called my dad when I AWOLD and I told him, hey, dad, can you come pick me up? Like, I just escaped. <laughs> I AWOLD, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be there, whatever. He thought I was joking and he hung up. And I was like, damn, I got to get home. I, I made it home. And when I walked in, he was surprised. Like, what the hell? What? And I said, man, I called you. I told you. And he was just like speechless. Like, didn't want to say nothing. I went upstairs, showered, came down. And I asked him, like, hey, what do you want me to do? 
You want me to stay? You want me to leave? The cops are going to probably be coming this way. And he exploded, bro. He kicked my ass. He kicked my ass and told me to get out. Well, I did get out and I left. I was so tired, David. I was just trying to get to my homeboy's pad. I was maybe like a block away from his pad. Got pulled over by the cops. They seen me, they recognized me, were wondering what I was doing back on the streets. And I ran and I got my ass kicked by them too. <laughs> <laughs> Double beating up. <laughs> I go to the police station, lo and behold, <clears throat> one of my brothers comes in the police station too. So I'm the youngest and my brother was like, what the hell? He was shocked to see me there. Mm-hmm. We ended up going to juvenile hall the same night and they had to call my dad and tell him that not just one son, but two of his sons were going to juvenile hall. Mm-hmm. And my dad felt so guilty because he kicked me out the house. Wow. And he feels that was a very pivotal point in my life where he, he told me he felt that he could have had some control in that where he would have helped me out to hide, helped me out to stay in the house or I, I would have not got caught that way, or I would have not got my ass, because the cops gave me a good one, man. <laughs> yeah. And whatever, they I guess I had it coming, whatever. I, I don't, I'm not mad about that. Mm-hmm. But I told my dad it wasn't his fault, and I just told him, man, it, it. I believe God has put me in places, has put me through trials and tribulations for a reason, Yeah. to become the person that I am today. You know, so, and I explained that to him and I explained that to him recently again, because I don't get to see him that much. Yeah. Now I can't sit here and tell you if he still feels guilty because he he probably does, man. Yeah. But no, he's proud of me. And and he's told me that as a, as an adult, I'm a, I'm not, I wasn't a kid when he told me that, but as an adult to get his, I guess I could say his approval to this day feels good, man. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how old I am. Yeah, for sure. Do you think it would have made a difference with him giving you the approval that you craved, the attention that you needed back then? Do you think that would have helped you stay away from the streets? Because obviously it wasn't your dad. It wasn't your dad who was uh, drunk or beating your mom or, 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 you know, on the streets teaching you this stuff, right? It was the actual streets itself. So do you think him giving you that approval at home, right, would have helped you to stay away from the streets? Maybe chose a different path i don't honestly i don't think so david because Mm -hmm. um i was set on what i wanted to do you know Mm -hmm. and 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 here's the thing with me is that i've learned even as a young kid Mm -hmm. if i set my heart my mind and my soul into something i'm Mm -hmm. gonna do it and that's what my heart mind and soul were set on were to be Mm -hmm. in the to to be the person that i was and I don't think my dad could have changed that. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody could have, because one of my older brothers um, was in the military mm-hmm. and he tried, you know, I even had a conversation with him and it was, it was kind of like a hard conversation, man, because he was kind of, he's kind of like a father figure too. Yeah. And, um, he felt guilty about all this, like about me and like it, it pained him for years, man, mm-hmm. that, in there because he felt responsible he felt that oh if he would have not left to the military so soon or if he would have been around like it would have been different Mm -hmm. Uh, and i told him like hey bro like all all the whoopings you would have gave me all Mm -hmm. the whoopings that would have given it would have not it would have not helped it would have not stopped me from what i wanted to do and what i wanted to become um now my dad was the sole provider for all of us and so he was at work a lot of the times yeah so may maybe that could have played a factor i i don't know i and and, and i don't want to say like oh if he would have been home more i would have i would have been different mm-hmm. but again i i don't know david because my mind was set mm-hmm. on something at such a young age and that's what i wanted to do that's what i wanted to become mm-hmm. so i i can't I don't, I, I can't really answer that question to say if, if he was around more, if he would have gave mm-hmm. me that approval that, 
I love you, Mijo. I'm proud of you. If it would have changed. If it would have changed anything. Okay. I hear that. Um, let me ask you this other in another way. What was the draw that was so strong to where that was the streets drew you, right? Even from your father who was raising you in a right way. Like how, where was the breakdown? Like what was so captivating to you to where you, like you said, my heart was set on this lifestyle. What put you on that path? What do you I, think? I think what it was, was basically the people that I grew up with and what I was seeing at that time. Mm -hmm. And so like my homies that were involved in things were older than me. They were like 14, 15, 16 years old. And I was the little kid. Yeah. And that intrigued me that that lifestyle just like, that's what I wanted, you know? Yeah. And so maybe if I would have seen something different, maybe it, it would have been different, but mm -hmm. I can't call it. Yeah. I think basically it was that basically the kids and, and the group that I was around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's crazy because that you mentioned that because I remember my father, when I was getting in trouble, you know, I remember one time um, we had went to Anheuser-Busch, right? And mm -hmm. it was where the train would bring in all the beer and they had it with these rolled down doors and they would lock it. Well, we found a way to break into there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm stealing a keg. I'm running with a little pony keg and it's snowing and I fall and it, I hit the steps and the rim of the, the uh, keg yeah. just shattered my finger. I mean, it shot blood everywhere. It ex totally exploded my finger. Right. Yeah. And the cops come cause the silent alarms going and everything. And I'm going, I'm, I'm hauling, butt, and I cover myself in snow and everything. So the cops and they pass me about three or four times, you know, I'm face down in like two feet of snow, <laughs> not yeah. trying to move. They can't find me. They found the blood, okay, because my finger had exploded. So they yeah. followed the blood all the way to where I was, and they kicked me in the ribs. And I'm like, get up. Well, instead of taking me to jail, they took me to my dad because they recognized who I was, and they recognized who my dad was. And they knew they're like, we take him to jail, I ain't going to do nothing. Let's just take him to his dad. His dad's going to whoop his ass because my dad is notorious for, for being the guy who he's, – he's pretty strict, right? So yeah. they took me home, and, man – I remember just that look my dad gave me, like, when they leave, I'm going to kill you. You know what I mean? And I was like, I even told the cops, oh, don't take me home. Take me to jail. Don't take me home. Because I, I was more afraid of my dad, you know. Yeah. And um, he talked to me and, you know, he asked me what the hell was I thinking and stuff like that. And he was more disgusted. And that hurt me more than him beating the shit out of me, honestly. Yeah. He was just so disappointed. He's like, I didn't raise you like that. You know, and then he he went on to this to the whole speech of, you know, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. And, and then that's when he told me he's like the people you are hanging around with are gonna cause you to fall. And he was absolutely right. There's one kid I remember to this day, and he's he's actually dead. And uh, my dad told me when he met him, he's like, Oh, I don't want that kid in my house. He's gonna wind up dead or in prison. Needless to say, that guy wound up dead in prison. I you know what I'm saying? And he called it right out the gates. He met him for 10 minutes and he told me, he's like, I don't want that kid. He's casing our house. Don't ever bring him in my house again. Yeah. And I remember that dude. That was one of the guys I was with that night that were stealing kegs, you know? And it's just crazy how our fathers know this stuff. They, you know, they, they, they know exactly. They see the path and sometimes they can catch us and get us. But like yeah. you said, you were just surrounded by it 24 seven, you know, just the streets. It was something that got you and captivated you and your mind was set, you know, and I, I find that interesting. Yeah, it was, it was set, man. Like I got, I knew like they had asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd be like, I want to be a cholo. Mm -hmm. I want to be this. I want to be that. And, and I became it, man. And, you know, when, as time went by mm -hmm. and my, like I said, my mentality started changing. I guess I started maturing, right? Yeah. And, you know, throughout, I, throughout my whole life, man, um, there has always been people that have seen something in me that mm -hmm. I didn't see in myself. 
And even in there, people seen something in me that I didn't really realize, but they, some people seen the bad and mm-hmm. they wanted to use that for them. Right. Like, Oh man, he's, we can count on him. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of people that they didn't want to see me there. And I'm talking about like these guys, they're, they're like important people in there. And when I would go to the hole, the shoe and they'd see me there, they'd get mad. Like, what are you doing here? why are you still here? Like when, why haven't you gone home? And mm. I like, well, I caught another case or I raised my hand for this or, you know, so towards the end of all that. And I was realizing like, damn, there, you know what? Since I was a kid, like someone has actually always believed in me mm. and I haven't believed in myself like that, you know? So I started like, it's, it's, it's been a gradual gradual change uh mm-hmm. today it's still i'm still uh evolving yeah and i started putting my efforts into well if i know i could do this bad stuff what if i do good what if i put my heart my mind and my soul into this that's good yep make it happen and sure enough i can you know and that's why like i'm not a cocky person but i'm confident in myself quietly like if I get told to do something, if I can't make it happen, I'm gonna find a way to do it, or I'm gonna ask for help. Right. You know, I'm, hey, I don't, I don't know how to do it. like at work. I, I don't know what, what was that. What did you say? Like I don't know what that means. But mm-hmm. um, that has actually helped me um, now as an adult realizing my worth. You know, mm-hmm. my roots. You know. Um, and I think a lot of people that are still trapped in that in that lifestyle um, don't realize the worth, man. Because if I I look back now, mm-hmm. and I'm David, you you if if you go to prisons, and you're gonna find some good people, yeah, because of what they are. And you would think you've been in this trade way longer than me. You know a lot more than me. And you'd be like, damn, he'd probably be a good lineman. Right. You'd be a good leader out here. And they just they're stuck with what they only know. And I feel that a lot of those people don't realize their worth. And I've seen a lot of people, a lot of men in there that have kids and that had been have been in there 20, 30 years and had kids when they first went in and their kids never knew them. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I didn't have kids. But now that I have my two girls, I I can't imagine doing that, bro. Mm -hmm. I I can't imagine being there and not, and knowing that I'll never see my girls in a, in the free world or I won't be there to raise them, you know? Yeah. So yeah, having my daughters have changed, uh, has, has changed me like completely. I think it's, um, I think it's pretty cool that you said about, realizing your worth that you finally had to come full circle to realize your worth. Now I'm going to tie that in with our daughters. Okay. How many young ladies out there are doing things that are just horrendous, right? Adult industry. um, Let's take it a different level, even down to the street level where they're selling themselves. Okay. Doing these things for money, right? Because they didn't realize their worth, you know, It, it, you can be told all the time, all the time, and people can speak life into you. You're amazing. You're awesome. You're great. But at the end of the day, you have to believe what they are saying. I know for me, like you, when I was in the military, we'd have room inspections. And I still remember this guy. His name was Farmery, his last name. We called him Instructor Farmery. And we're doing this room inspection. They're checking out our dive, our dive knives and stuff like that. And They'd come in and make sure there's no sand on the deck or anything like that. And uh, he comes in and he sees these pictures of my family, you know, because I grew up in the mountains hunting, you know, pretty rambunctious. We're out outdoor kids. And he sees my family, sees me with elk and all this different stuff. Right. And he looks at me. He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, seriously, you look like you come from a pretty 
okay family. He's like, what are you doing here? And at that moment, I was too young. I was 18 years old, young. And I took offense to it. I took offense. I'm like, oh, what do you mean? You don't want me here? You don't think I'm good enough to be here? What? You know, automatically, whatever goes in your head, because you're young, you're dumb, you're impressionable, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just having past wounds from not being able to fit in and stuff like that, I started letting those emotions come out and get kind of triggered. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm older and I'm more wiser, I understand what he's saying. He saw something just like you. He saw something in me, just like that guy in prison saw something in you. And he was wondering, you are made for more. Yeah. You need to be able to see it. Yeah. You know, and it's crazy how life, you have to go through these different channels, these different valleys and, and different things to come full circle and to step into your calling to what God has in store for you. Yeah. I think that's amazing, dude. I really do. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I, I'm asked a lot by, you know, cause there's, there's a handful of people in our trade that know about me mm -hmm. and, you know, they they come from all walks of life, you know, like all kinds of like different lifestyles, mm -hmm. color, you know, it's not just a white guy or a Mexican guy or a black guy. Like I got friends of, of everything, man. And, um, they they tell me too like dude like you can you can do good you can be good you know like mm -hmm. there's there's nothing that you can't do if you're able to overcome this or that like what can't you do you know and and i look at that and they ask that the thing that they ask is like damn you don't regret it like you didn't have your teenage years or, or your 20s and you know i used to answer that question by like what 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 did i i miss like if it was something i've never had you know and in a sense it's true but then now that i'm older and i think a little different man i do wonder what my teenage would have been like i i do wonder what my 20s would be like uh and i feel that if i would have never went through what i went through what i put myself through um I think I wouldn't be here talking to you. Right. You know? So I, I don't regret nothing, David. As as bad or good as that sounds, I don't, man, because um I'm thankful for everything that I've gone through, good, bad, and ugly. You know, I'm thankful for it. Um uh, I thank God for giving me the mindset that I have, the strength, the yeah. ability to endure a lot of things that um, maybe to some people it, it won't be easy, you know, right. um, you know, and, you know, I, I did tell you with my daughters, um, so I have a seven-year-old mm -hmm. and I have a five-year-old. My five-year-old has, was born with Down syndrome. Okay. All right. Um, we sorry, didn't know. Sorry to hear that, man. Nah, you're good, bro. And you don't even, I mean, a lot of people would say that, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's not a sorry, man. It's, it's, it's a blessing now. I mean, yeah. I was in the beginning, I was, man, I, I, it was, it hurt, man. Cause I, I, I didn't know nothing about uh, special needs, uh, let alone down syndrome. I mean, I've seen kids with, uh, with special needs or even with down syndrome and I'd be always be like, man, look at that kid, like over the seat though, you know, like, damn. Yeah. Um, and when I had my daughter, like it, it was hard, man. Um, you know, cause it was a birth diagnosis and then she had a uh, open heart surgery at two months. Um, yeah, man. And then she had a, a feeding tube in her stomach because she couldn't, she couldn't swallow, man. And so we would have to feed her, um, every two hours or three hours throughout the clock through a feeding tube, this machine that would go in her stomach. Mm -hmm. And that was terrible, bro. I don't wish that on nobody. And that was the first, I would say maybe moment in my life where, man, I, I didn't know what to do. I felt helpless. Like I, um, seeing my daughter cut open, her chest open, seeing her in these machines, them telling us they don't know, you know? 
Um, and then also hearing people tell me, oh, man, you got this, Pablo, like God doesn't put nothing in your on your plate you can't handle. That used to piss me off after a while. Right. I was never mad at God, but I just, I was questioning myself or asking God, like, why are you putting me through this? Like, what's the purpose of this? You know, mm -hmm. you know, and I would play those through my mind and, and I would say to myself, like, damn, how much more can I take? You know, like, what can I do? Like, and it, it was just a very hard situation. And that, that happened been we had so many medical scares with with her um for like the first two years of her life um now she's good man she's she's down syndrome doesn't go away mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a lifetime uh me and uh my kid's mom we're not together but we're pretty cordial when it comes to the kids and we're on the same page pretty much you know mm -hmm. um and I have communications with my daughters. Uh, when I go visit, when I get some time off of work, I go and I get an Airbnb or sometimes she'll let me stay at her house and I'll stay there and I'll take care of the kids and I spend time or sometimes she'll bring the kids to come see me for a week or a weekend, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because she understands like what I do um, and that I'm the father, you know. And I can say this, man, my daughters love me. Like, and I love my daughters, bro. And they know who I am. Um, they come to me for, you know, even, <laughs> it's funny, my daughter that has Down syndrome, she's not verbal, but I can understand what she's trying to tell me. So I, I bought them both an iPad. And so when she has an issue or she's upset or she's trying to communicate something, she'll FaceTime me. And if it's something like her mom doesn't want to do for her because mom says you can't, she'll call me and she'll start <laughs> telling on her mom, like, hey, mom ain't letting me do this. And then mom will come like, hey, she's mad because I didn't let her get Doritos or something, you know? <laughs> I have to be like, look, baby, if mama said no, that means no, like, you can't call me and tell me, like, and make her to give you Doritos because or whatever. And mm -hmm. I talk to her like that, David. I don't talk to her like as if she's different. Yeah. You know, I talk to her the way I talk to my other daughter. And um, she understands, man. And um, whenever I come around, um, she's more loving than what my oldest daughter is. Both my daughters are loving. But when she sees me, she'll drop everything. And she runs to me and hugs me. And it's like, man, you you know the feeling, man. And, yeah. and it's, it's a great feeling, man. You can't even put that into words, man. And and to have that with my girls, even though I'm not there 24-7 like their mom, like, it's an amazing feeling, man. Yeah. Money yeah. can't buy it, right? Money can't buy it, bro, at all. And... Even mom gets mad. She's like, whenever you come around, I'm chopped liver. Like, I don't even exist. And I'm like, good. You should, <laughs> you know? hey, they, you should be happy that that it, it's like that. Because I'm here. Like, even though I'm not financially, I'm there. But, you know, being an apprentice right now and prior to being an apprentice, obviously being a ground man. You know, there's a lot of sacrifices I've had to do, you know, like I missed a lot, man. You know, being away from your kids, like you don't get that time back, you know. Mm -mm. Um, and so doing the work that that I'm doing now and being an apprentice now, it's 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 hard, man, but I feel that my kids understand that, man. As as young as they are, I feel that they understand that. Mm -hmm. And and that's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, that'll definitely keep you going. Um, that's good to see that they're on the same page and they see daddy there. I think one of the most important things you're doing, Pablo, is you are spending quality time versus quantity time with them. And I think that 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 is tremendous, seriously, because, you know, in this industry, in this trade, for you guys who are listening, who don't know what we do, 
being a lineman, there's a lot of sacrifices. You guys only hear, oh, lineman, they make a lot of money. Well, we do. But guess what? That money isn't given to us or handed out to us. There's a lot of sacrifice that we do to be able to make that money. And not everybody can do it. And when we do do it, there is sacrifices that are tied with that. And one of them is our presence being away from our families. So when we are gone like that, it's important, like what Pablo is doing and what we stress at our foundation to be able to, to be where your feet are, to have quality time over quantity of time. Cause what good is your time? If you're home and you're not even there, you're checked out, right? You're, you're in the next room. Yeah. but you're on your phone or you're in the next room and you're watching TV and your kids are all over the house. And what good is that? I'd rather have a father who's working a lot of hours. And when he comes off, it's daddy time. Come on, boys. Come on, girls. Let's go. Let's do this. And just creating those memories. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. Pablo, one of the things that I thought was pretty awesome that you said that kind of brought up some thoughts to myself is when you were talking about how you are questioning, right? Cause it's, it's very easy to question God, not blame him, but question, or, you know, I don't even, I don't even think that it would be wrong to even blame God. Seriously. Um, God is not small for us to think that he's going to get offended for us blaming for anything. Okay. <laughs> and he wants to know our pain. He wants to know what's going on. He wants to have that relationship with us. And I remember when my wife got sick, that was one of the questions. She's like, man, I'm at the peak of my life. Why now? Why God? Why am I sick? And I remember hearing her praying that or asking God to take her life when she was in so much pain, mm. you know, and there's nothing like you, there's nothing you can do here. Yeah. I am praying to God, asking why, you know, trying to hold back the tears in the next room because my wife is wanting to die in the, uh, the you know, the room next to me and questioning, you know, just, and I'm, and, and, you know, I had that, that thought that was probably what you're going through as well, you know, wondering why, why God, why, you know, and then like you said, people coming to you, oh, you can handle Paul, God will only give you what you can handle. And I could see why you'd get upset because it's like, you don't even know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Walk in my shoes. Right. And, um, it's hard. It's hard. So I, 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 I can see where you're coming from with that is what I'm saying. And there's, I mean, there was a, you know, the, the man that brought me into this trade that told me about this trade. Um, mm -hmm. um, his name is Will Fields, black man. He's been mm -hmm. through what I've been through. You know, he grew up South central. He was involved with, with the stuff. He, we've been places. And I remember when, you know, I found out the what was going on with my daughter, right? Because I didn't know right away. It, and it's, I, I could get into details with that. That'll take forever. But it was a strange feeling when she was born. There was a different feeling. I felt that there was something wrong. Um, I, don't, I don't know where that came from. I, I, I don't know. But I felt something was wrong. She was born healthy, though, man. Um, and when I found out about when the doctors told us, hey, you know what? She may be Down syndrome or because um, she never latched on to her mom. She never wanted to a, a breast, a get breast milk from her. And I guess the doctors knew, what, knew what's up because they and the nurses because they've done it so many times. They just couldn't tell us like, hey, she has Down syndrome, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, anyways, I called him and I told him like what was going on. And man, like I, I, I didn't call him to be emotional, to break down, but I did, man. And he was like, so what does that mean? I said, man, she had, she's going to have Down syndrome. He was like, man. And I was like, well, she's going to have Down syndrome. He was like, so what? Like, was that going to make her less of your daughter? Like, mm. So what? It doesn't matter. And when he said that, and maybe to some people, they would have got offended or because he was so like, just cutthroat with it. Yeah. And, but it's, it slapped me. It was like reality check, man. I was like, you know what? You're right. So what? You know, like, yeah, she may be different, but that's my daughter, you know? And, um, 
that was like a turning point, even though it was the beginning, I didn't realize it then. But as time went by and all the stuff that we ended up going through behind that, behind her health and all these things, I, I would think back to what he said to me, you know, and that helped me a lot because he wasn't one of the ones like, Hey, Pablo, God doesn't put nothing on your plate. You can't handle, yeah. you know, he wasn't, he, he didn't say that he would just encourage. Right. And um, to this day, he encourages, he calls me. If I don't text him like for a few days, he calls me like, Hey, homie, you ain't checked in homie. What's going on? You good? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And he checks in on me, you know, and, and this guy, he's a GF now. Like he's, he's man, he's a good dude, man. And a lot of people in this trade, you know, a, a lot of the things I do as a father in life in general, a lot of it comes from my past, from my experiences in prison and juvenile hall and California youth authority. It, and, and now in this trade, when I see some of the men um, and some women now that I've gotten a chance to meet, how they push, you know, the ones that are parents, um, not all of them are great. Not all of them are good. And you know this, David, some yeah. people involved in other things that maybe they shouldn't be or whatever. But I see examples of what I want to do, what I want to be, what I don't want to do and what I don't want to be, you know? Yeah. And I've been blessed, man, to have been able to meet and work with some solid good linemen that were family men mm. that had a wife and kids and they were all on the same page and they weren't out cheating they weren't mm. out doing their thing you know um and those guys gravitated towards me mm -hmm. as a woman and these guys are linemen these guys are foremen these guys are supervisors these guys are gfs and dude, they would call me and be like, Hey, Pablo, how are you doing? You know, not even about work. How you been, bro? Like, are you an apprentice now? Hey, I'm proud of you, man. Like how your daughter's doing mm -hmm. you, like stuff outside of work. And I'm blessed to call those guys friends, you know? And I think a lot of people use that word friend loosely. Yeah. Like, these guys are my friend, man. And, and these guys are not for my walk of life. Um, you know, they're from a totally different world almost. Yeah. But they've shown me how I want to be when I get to their position. Mm. I want to be as a father. If I ever do find a wife or, or whatever, you know, um, how I want to be in a relationship and, um, Maybe a lot of people think of this trade as just people that party and rock and roll or whatever, got money, and mm -hmm. it's not that, man. And I've been blessed to to have met people like that. Um, the guy that got me in the trade, Will, you know, he's a great father, great provider. Um, a lot of other guys, man, that I could just name, you know, mm -hmm. guys that I can call on late at night whenever and they'll answer me. I can't call the homies in the hood and be like, hey, hey, fool, they ain't gonna answer me. No. You know? So it's like, that's why being where I'm at now, and, and some people may find it hard to understand, but I'm from Southern California. I'm in Northern California. Yeah. I came at 1245 to work and I had my daughters, but it was one, it's probably the best thing I could have done, David, mm -hmm. because besides my daughter going through what she was going through, like, like I said, I'm evolving every day mm -hmm. to being able to be away from certain people, certain areas. It's gave me perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think in turn, it just made me a better individual all the way around as a worker and as a father, mm -hmm. as a human being. It's funny how sometimes we just got to get out of our the area that we're at, right? We need to see another place, right? Yeah. In order to get that perspective. Um, we left from New Mexico to California. And it was weird because 
we had to leave there to see a different perspective to see what we needed to do. And it's true. I mean, when you're caught up where you're comfortable, Mm -hmm. a lot of times, I think that kills your vision that kills your dream because you're not growing, you're not challenged. Yeah. So sometimes you need to go where you need to be challenged and that's going to create the most growth. Yes. As an individual, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's, that's exactly what you're experiencing now, you know, with all these different trials and stuff in, in your life, you're not using that to set a stage for you to be a victim. You're using it to set a stage to better your circumstance and your situation and probably try to rectify some of the wrongs in your past, you know, to, to, to be that example that you didn't have growing up with the guys on the street. Right. And it's, it's crazy that you recognize it. Cause I I know exactly what you're talking about. You will see guys in this industry, in this trade, and you're just like, man, he's going down the wrong path. Yeah. And it sucks because you want to tell them they're on the wrong path. But sometimes you telling them something isn't going to change it. It's just going to make it worse. Yeah. Sometimes they need to fall on their face for them and fall in the gutter. And it sounds awful, but sometimes people need to hit rock bottom for them to make the change for themselves. I had a, a, a good friend of mine, a guy I look up to. He's a pastor. He's a part of our board. He's a lineman as well. In fact, he owns a line company now. And, uh, I would get so mad at him and he'd tell, I'd, I'd tell him we had this one guy who would come over and I'd be like, man, that guy's over there flirting with your wife. He's a bad dude. Why do you have him here? And he'd look at me. He's like, Dave, he's like, I know what he's doing. He's like, I'm not dumb. I'm, I'm a lineman. I know. He's like, but I trusted my wife and I know, I know I have trust in her. Yeah. He's like if, if I was to tell this guy, get out of my house, you piece of crap, whatever. He's like, oh, then how would that help him? This guy is here because he needs help. He's like, we're called to give people a hand up, not a hand out. That's right. I like that. You know, and, and I think that's what we see in this industry with like that guy you're talking about, your mentor, and with a lot of other guys. Brady Hansen, who came on our, our podcast, talked about having connections in life and making good connections. And that's so true in this trade. We have the ability to network to meet so many different people out there. I have met great people and I have met some of the worst people in my life in this industry. You know what I mean? But nevertheless, you still meet them and you can learn something from everybody. Even if it's not to be like that guy or don't do work like this guy or whatever, you can learn something from everybody as long as you keep open and you don't allow offenses to keep you separated because when you get offended with people yeah you can't see that they are hurting yeah you know yeah there you go yeah yeah and that's that's the thing is like i've been able because of my experiences and because of where i've been at it's like i've been able to like know people Mm -hmm. like if i see somebody i'm like okay like like how your dad said about your friend, hey, he's going to end up either dead or in prison. Mm-hmm. Like you see people and you're like, okay, like, yeah, you know. And I I think one of the biggest changes for me mm-hmm. was not taking offense because I did used to take offense. Like there was a certain tone that I wanted to be spoken like to at one time. Yeah. But that, 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 that came from in there, you know there was a a certain way that you had to approach me because of the way I was. And it wasn't easy, David. Like when I first got out, man, I struggled, man. And Mm -hmm. I struggled like bad. I, I, it was hard for me to adapt out here, you know, and I did go back. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went back on purpose because I needed a break, you know, and when I went in there, I was like, man, hell no. <laughs> yeah, I never wanted to go back again. <laughs> so I never went back. Mm-hmm. And I've been out here pretty much since, man. It's been almost 10 years now, David. Wow. And I've been here. And I have two daughters. I never wanted kids. But 
I have, I've been blessed with two girls, man. And I'm happy, man. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of things I've been through last year was a trying year for me, mm -hmm. but here, man. And I, I can't think of anything that's going to knock me down, man. Mm -hmm. I can't, as long as I got my girls and you know, God forbid anything ever happens. I, I'm still going to be standing, David. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to be here. And I believe there's a better place, you know? Absolutely. Get back to this. You know, and as long as you keep putting God first in your life and just keeping that in your forefront and then just, just providing for your daughters and being that present dad, that show up dad, everything's going to go good for you. I'm not saying that life's going to be easy because you and I both know that ain't the way mm -hmm. stuff works. Yeah, but God will see you through everything you go through. And that's a promise, brother. Once again, this is David with the show up dad. I want to thank you, Pablo. I'm so proud of you, brother. Um, I know when I met you up at Woodland, when we were doing the climbing class, I, I saw you, and I was like, man, this guy's an interesting cat, you know, and um, I'm glad we became friends. And, you know, yeah. I got to do this interview with you and just be able to share your story on my platform, brother. I know it's going to help tremendous people out, or a tremendous amount of people out there, brother. I appreciate you. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. And man, if I can do it, anybody can. There's there's no excuse, David. Mm -hmm. You gotta want it. Absolutely, man. Well, once again, thank you. This is David with the Show Up Dad, my guest Pablo, and uh, you guys keep being Show Up Dads. Thank you. <laughs>